Hello, everybody. Today, I'd like to talk to you about something that probably none of you care about, space. And this is a real image, actually, of our galaxy, the Milky Way, rising over Mount Fuji. And despite this being a real image, this doesn't feel real. It feels like it's in a National Geographic or a default desktop background. And I feel like that's because, in part, we don't actually see the sky very often. We had a presentation talk about light pollution, and it's true, about 80% of the Earth's land mass cannot see the Milky Way at all. Believe it or not, this is San Francisco sans lights. Imagine if a city like San Francisco had a sky like this. And in fact, Alberta's got sort of a, a, a special connection to space, I think, which is that we get to see the uh, Northern Lights. But even the Northern Lights are so much more complicated than you know, just some wisps in the sky. It really is a global phenomenon. And it begs the question, you know, space seems quite complicated, and we have our own complexity here on Earth. How do we really know anything about space at all? And so I'd like to start by just saying the same way that we know about anything on Earth. We observe patterns, and we connect causal events. So this is a nautilus shell that formed more or less on its own in the ocean. Why this shape? Why is it not a cube? How did we get such uniformity in a turbulent, wavy ocean? Or a hurricane? How do we group a bunch of tiny, light particles into a huge Category 5 hurricane to wallop an island? Or why do they rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and the opposite direction in the south? Or why does it sort of take the same shape as the Nautilus shell? Or of this galaxy? They all look remarkably similar. And that's because they are. We are all made of the same stuff. The Earth is not just a platform by which we view the universe. We're actually part of it. In fact, this galaxy is so big that if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take 37 million years to cross. This is an image of Saturn's rings. And what you're seeing is actually a wave that's traveling through the rings. It looks a lot like water waves, actually caused by a moon that's orbiting in these rings, tugging on ice and dust particles. And why is there such uniformity with so many moving parts? Or why are the peaks spaced in that way? Or maybe the, the waves in the soil here of the Andes Mountains of Chile. I mean, there's wind in sort of multiple directions, but we get these sort of uniformly spaced ridges. By the way, this is not the Andes, although that sounded like a really legitimate lie. This is the surface of Mars. This is a real image of Mars that we took with a robot. You can see it in the bottom left. This is the Andes, OK? But if I told you that this was Mars, it's barren enough that you'd believe me. Actually, that's because that was also a lie, and this is also the surface of Mars. <laughs> yes, we've really explored it that much, this detail. I'm, what I'm trying to sort of relay is that we don't just look at the universe. We were developed in the universe. And we don't even have to look that far. So in the late 50s, uh, the Soviet Union in the Cold War was like, hey, let's launch a little softball space satellite. Just put it at the top of the Earth, not too far. And the US was like, how about nah? And they basically invented NASA from the ground up, invented the space rocket, and went to the moon in 10 years. And they succeeded. This is real. This is a real image from Apollo 11 of the surface of the moon with our Earth. I mean, it's pretty amazing that if you were Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin walking the Earth, Sorry, Michael Collins, he just had to stay in orbit, RIP. You could cover all of history and politics and economics just with your right hands. And this is Neil Armstrong immediately after walking the surface. And you can see that he's visibly happy. I mean, he's trying, there's that, but he just walked on the moon. I mean, ha you know, how much more existential can that get? I would have loved to be in this position. And this is New York City the day the astronauts returned. Can anybody here imagine our population being this stoked about a space mission? No, of course not. Nobody cares. But look at this. People were so excited. I mean, people really felt space here. It was like a tangible connection because we touched it. But we don't have to send humans, nor can we at the moment, past the moon. We can just send a little robot, like Cassini, for example. And it took about seven years to get to Saturn. A direct route's about three, but it's got to sling around some planets. And we see this amazing structure. I mean, there's this hexagonal structure, the sunlight sort of coming from the right. It's hard to really see how big these things are because there's no comparison image. In 2005, we actually sent a probe called New Horizons. I say we like I had anything to do with it. But <laughs> we sent a probe in 2005. 
and it took 10 years, but it got to Pluto on schedule. And this is Pluto. We flew right by Pluto. It's got an atmosphere, a rocky surface. And despite us not being able to explore beyond the solar system with a probe, space is just far too big, we can launch huge detailed telescopes into space, take images like this. None of you have any idea what this is because there's no context, right? It's just a colorful circle. Is it a galaxy? Is it a planet? Is it a single star? How big is it? Well, each of this and the last image are actually a star that's died and it's exploded and it's sort of blown off its, uh, its uh, outer layers. This is called the Crab Nebula. And right in the center, there's a tiny star the size of Edmonton that weighs as much as our sun and it's rotating 30 times per second. I, I, this is real, and we know this because we just observe light. We really stress the importance of light. And now we can look out with these detailed telescopes and see, for example, the Cigar Galaxy. I didn't name it, but pretty cool name. And there are billions of other galaxies just like ours out there that we can look at. In fact, this image is just a small, dark pixel in the sky about the size of a pinhead. And the Hubble Space Telescope opened its shutter for a very long time. And this is what it saw. Every piece of light here is a galaxy. Everything. Everything, even the little bits in the back and not just the obvious ones. So what I'd like you to think about the next time you see the northern lights is that we're not just spectators in the universe. We were developed by the universe. And we actually have a special place within it. So please remember the next time you think about space that there actually is something interesting out there. <laughs> Thank you.